Hello and welcome to the online ministry of New Westminster Christian Reformed Church. We hope that today's message will be a word of encouragement for you from our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to contact our church or our pastors, please visit our website at nwcrc.ca. May God bless you. Yes, we begin a new series this morning that takes us through the book of Genesis. Genesis quite literally meaning beginning or the beginning of, the start of, and that brings us right back to the very beginning of, of history, the beginning of creation. And in the beginning is God. I want to invite us to read together the opening chapter of Genesis Genesis chapter 1 through chapter 2 verse 3, which really is one unit of text. This is the word of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let the dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights. The greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind and God saw it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water and the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image. In our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I will give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. 
And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Then the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Thus far, our reading from God's word. congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, I hope that all of us will catch a glimpse of how this foundational story gives wonderful meaning and purpose to our lives. I hope that we'll catch a glimpse of how this foundational story gives wonderful meaning and purpose to our lives. Now, maybe some of you haven't thought about Genesis 1 that way, giving wonderful meaning and purpose to our lives, but truly it does. Of course, our text is first and foremost about God. God revealing something about himself, first to Israel and, of course, to us. And this God is wholly other than the gods that would have existed in the minds of Israel back in the ancient Near East. This God is wholly unique, wholly different than the gods that they would have imagined, but this text wants to tell them and us something about this great God. He's revealing something about himself. He's revealing his purpose for the world and for all creation. And revealing his purpose for those who have been made in his image, male and female, humankind. You see, this story gives wonderful meaning and purpose to our lives. Now, before we get into the text a little bit more specifically, I want to say some kind of introductory remarks about worldview and how it is that we are to approach this text or read this text. Remember, it it was written thousands of years ago, likely maybe 3,000 plus years ago when Moses, who we believe was the author of this book, when he presented it to the Israelites, most likely in the wilderness at that time. You need to know that the question of authorship and when the people of Israel first received it is a debated question. And I'm not gonna get into that debate with us this morning. The tradition though is that Moses was the author and likely Israel in the wilderness, having just come out of Egypt, is receiving this text, perhaps for the very first time. So, as we think about this text, we need to appreciate our worldview, but Put it aside for the moment and understand more fully Israel's worldview. When you and I think about worldview, we're talking about the way the world works. How do we think about our lives and the way that our lives are lived out in the world in which we live in? Those are worldview kind of questions. and and they often get at sort of foundational, first-order questions. Worldview talks about questions like, where did we come from? Where are we going? And does our life have any meaning? How might we answer those questions today in our century? Well, I think that this 20th century scientist, a paleontologist by the name of George Gaylord Simpson. I think that many people could relate to the way in which he thought about our world. At one point, he was quite famous for offering this particular quote when he said, 
Man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. Man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. People in our day who have no use for God, no belief in God, can't help but accept this as a statement of truth about the world. And the person from whom I first read this quote, he said, this is not unlike how, say, Macbeth shares in the Shakespeare play when he sees Lady Macbeth who's committed suicide. Macbeth says this, life's a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Now, those are worldview statements. And there are people in our culture who think that way. And if you're a therapist, a counselor, a pastor, people who works with people that experience anxiety and despair, if they have this worldview, no wonder they are experiencing despair. There's nothing hopeful about that worldview. That's not the worldview of Israel, though. The worldview of Israel in the culture of the ancient Near East was undoubtedly a worldview influenced by Egypt, where they had been for 400 years. And there, in that world, the gods are very active, connected to all kinds of experiences in nature. There's sun gods that control the sun, moon gods, storm gods, thunder gods, fertility gods. And in their worldview, these gods were often battling each other or sometimes forming alliances with each other. In fact, the earth was kind of the playground or the battleground of the gods. And people needed to try and and ex, ex extract favor from the gods as they lived out their lives. In fact, in some of the ancient literature, human beings are really portrayed as pawns or slaves of the gods, beings that the gods use to accomplish whatever they need to accomplish. We have all kinds of ancient literature that goes way back in those cultures to origin stories that describe the gods and human beings in that way. Now, there were very special humans in the case of Egyptian culture. There was one person who was the image of God, and that would have been the Pharaoh. One person who was able to enter into the Holy of Holies in the Egyptian temple even sometimes in some cases just once a year. That person was made in the image of God. Human beings, though, were pawns of the gods. This is the worldview that many people in Israel would have been accustomed to and believed, perhaps, even. One writer says that the purpose of Genesis 1 is to shape Israel's view of who God truly is, of the world that God made, and of humankind and their place in it. And the writer does that by making points of contact with the literature we find in the first 11 chapters of Genesis and the other literatures of various origin stories from the neighboring cultures. Things like a flood, that's a point of contact. Trees, gardens, days. These are points of contact, but the narrator in Genesis presents a story that is radically different in so many ways from those neighboring cultures. Now, that's important for us to keep in mind. Israel would have understood some of these images and ways of structuring the story that we won't necessarily appreciate. But I talked about worldview a moment ago, and I want to say one more thing about that because it's so important for us to keep in mind when we read a text like Genesis. 
You know as well as I do that many people over the last, say, 200 years, maybe since the Enlightenment, have said, you know what, you can't trust the Bible. Why? Well, because Genesis 1 tells you that the Bible was created in seven days, or that the world was created in seven days, and we know that the world is at least, what, five billion years old. The Bible obviously can't be trusted. Well, whoever tells you that, let me tell you as clearly as I can, does not know the Bible. And that's important for us to remember. The Bible, we will see particularly the story in Genesis 1, doesn't really care about the age of the earth. Doesn't really care that much about how materially and structurally God created. So we are important to remind ourselves, we mustn't bring our questions to a text that doesn't intend to answer those questions. Let me give you an example. When I ask you the question, just a, a random question, what is a star? What's a star? I'm guessing that most of us, as we're thinking about that question in our minds, are thinking, well, a star is a fiery sphere of combustible material that's up in outer space. And that you would be right. But you didn't really tell me what a star is. You just told me how it was made. You didn't tell me anything about the purpose of a star. Because you could have said, well, it's a light in the sky that helps navigation, especially when you're out on the sea. Or it's a light in the sky that reminds us we're part of an infinitely large human family. Right? God says that about stars to Abraham. Your descendants will be like them. Or if you're an astrologist, which of course I'm not, and I hope none of you are, you might say, well, those stars tell us something about ourselves and our future. My point is, our worldview draws us to explanations of what it is, structurally, materially. And we tend to approach Genesis 1 that way too. And I'm going to invite us all this morning not to do that. Because the mind of Israel of the ancient Near East is not concerned about structure. About how old the earth is. How evolution worked or how animals came into being from a structural perspective. What the ancient mind is listening for is function, purpose, functions, and roles. That's what they're listening carefully for. And so we, as we read Genesis chapter 1, must think about, say, the question, what is the cosmos or how does the cosmos work? When you and I think about that question, we're often getting at structure, laws of grasp, law, the law of gravity or something else, evolutionary processes. But when the Israelite asked, how does the cosmos work? They're on a completely different wavelength because in the ancient worldview, function is a consequence of purpose. And so... What the author intends to do is he wants to talk about bringing the cosmos into existence by organizing, by assigning, by bringing order to chaos. The cosmos will start in a chaotic state, but Genesis is interested in bringing order, assigning responsibilities and boundaries and separations. And that's what we read in Genesis 1, right? According to their kinds, according to their kinds. The narrator is interested in showing how God assigns function and roles and responsibilities and order to what was chaotic. Listen to how one writer puts it. Genesis is interested in an organized world as against a chaotic world. 
and not in the metaphysical question of something against nothing. And that's so important for us to realize. Okay, let's look at the opening verses of our text. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Those are important Hebrew words, and I'll say more about them in a moment. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Formless and empty, formless and void in the Hebrew, tohu vabohu. And those words get used at different places in the Old Testament to describe other things as well. The idea that the ancient Near Eastern person would have in mind, well, we can lean on how maybe the Egyptians would have thought of these kinds of words, these concepts. After all, Israel very likely came out of that culture and had many of those images and ideas in their mind. In Egyptian views of origins, there is this concept of the non-existent. And when the Egyptian thinks about the non-existent, and that concept is connected to tohu vabohu, when the Egyptian thinks about the non-existent, they're not thinking materially, like something physical existing or not existing. They're not thinking about that. When they're thinking about non-existent, they're thinking about something that has not been differentiated, something that's not been assigned, something that has not been given boundaries or definition. That's one th way of approaching formlessness and emptiness. It's like potential that has not been defined yet, that has not been given purpose yet. In fact, there's another sense in Egyptian culture that this kind of realm of chaos is precisely this place of unharnessed potential, unused, unordered potential. And so the narrator brings those concepts before Israel and said, your God hovered over this unassigned, undefined existence and called forth order and function and purpose and role and beauty and flourishing. And there's something else we need to understand about tohu wabohu and even this concept of darkness that's right there in verse 2. Sometimes people have thought of that as evil, but the narrator makes no judgment about it. There's no sense in which this is sinister or menacing or evil or wicked. Quite frankly, I like how this author puts it, and I'll quote him here. There's nothing sinister or menacing about this chaos in Genesis. It is simply the indication that God has not yet done his work. So, the narrator begins with this description of God hovering over this nothingness, this emptiness, this formlessness, this void. And God calls forth from the chaos order and structure and function and beauty. Now, I could spend a great deal of time on these six days, and I just want to do it very briefly this morning. We heard from Zion the beautiful way in which God establishes, calls forth a form, and then fills those forms. The first three days, calling forth form, and then filling those forms on day four, five, and three, and, and six, rather. And, and I want to point out just one thing. There's many things that we could say about these six days of creation. One thing that that might strike us, that might cause a bit of tension in us. On day one, God creates light, and he separates the light from the darkness. And we have, it says, evening and morning the first day. 
But remarkably, the sun and the moon, the big light and the little light, don't show up until day four. How is it possible that there could be evening and morning without the sun and the moon? That might perplex people in our day. What that said to Israel long ago, and what it ought to say to us today, is, you see, the sun and the moon in the ancient world, they were gods. The writer of this narrative doesn't even use them by name. You noticed in the text, great light and lesser light. He doesn't even use the name sun and moon because those are the names of the god of the sun and the moon. So in a, in a very real sense, what God is doing in this is showing us the sun and the moon, they are nothing. They're no gods. And light and darkness, I don't need these luminaries to make light or darkness. Do you see how in a beautiful way, the narrator almost dismisses them by separating them for four days, right? It's almost like he intentionally pulls those things apart just to dismiss them as lesser luminaries. I don't need them to make light and darkness. It's a powerful way for the Lord to say, the way in which I am creating the heavens and the earth is wholly unique. I alone am able to speak and call forth order and function and purpose. As you know, God fills the sky, he fills the sea with creatures, and on the sixth day fills the land with all kinds of living creatures, culminating, culminating in the creation of humankind. Let us make man in our image. Let us, that's the first occasion of that expression, almost as if to say, these creatures are especially close to us. These creatures are especially dear to us, to God. We make them in our own image. And that's a remarkable statement because you already heard me say, Israel would have thought, no, people like Pharaoh or emperors of other cultures those who have been given elevated status, these are the image bearers of the God. And in our narrative, God says, humankind are made in my image. You see, in those neighboring cultures, it was only those very unique images of God that could go into the holy of holies in their temples and I visited some of those temples in Egypt when I visited there a few years ago only those who were in the image of God could go into the holy of holies in the temple but this narrative this narrative seems to be suggesting and I think it's much more than just a suggestion this God has fashioned a temple. That's what creation is. A temple of the living God. And he's putting his image in the temple. And it's humanity. And he's taking up residence in that temple. As he does on the seventh day. Oh, what a powerful picture for Israel and us to hear. What a powerful picture. We're going to say more about the understanding of this temple or this creation as God's temple. In fact, you might understand the garden as the holy of holies of that temple. We'll say more about that in coming weeks. But this temple is a place of order and of beauty and purpose. And you can hear how the author wants to speak against all of these pagan mythologies and clearly communicate that it is this God who has created all things, including the seas, the moon, and humanity in his image. I said at the beginning that this story gives 
wonderful meaning and purpose to our lives. Because when God created us in his image, he entrusted us with a very unique responsibility, having dominion over, subduing, bringing forth the fruit of the earth, calling forth from the earth its resources and its splendor, caring for the earth, filling the earth with humanity. What a beautiful task. And as you pay attention to that task, particularly as you see what Adam and Eve start doing in chapter 2, you see that their calling is to work alongside God to care for the earth, to draw from the earth its potential. In fact, I think that Genesis 1 has a powerful picture for us as we think about the lives that you and I live. In a very real sense, when you and I are doing things in life that are truly meaningful, that make a difference, that are having an impact, that bring satisfaction and purpose into our lives, that, that are accomplishing something, which of course all of us want to do. In a very real sense, what you and I are doing is calling forth from the chaos, calling forth from this unrealized potential, calling out from it beauty and order and function. Some of you know I like Jordan Peterson. He makes a lot of this in some of his lectures on Genesis chapter 1. And I think he was getting at something that's very helpful. We as creatures are the only ones that are able to do that. Through our words, through our language, through our cognitive functions. We are the only creatures that can call forth from something chaotic, something beautiful. And we do that even when we're very young. I loved Lego. You know that when I was a young kid. I loved Lego. The best thing for me was to put a big pile of bricks in the middle of the floor, dumping out a container full of bricks, and starting to make something. Imagining order out of that chaos. Building homes, building cities, building planes, or whatever it might be. Think about the work that you're involved in. Whatever that might be. You're a physician, and you're confronted with uh, an illness, a disease that's hurting and decaying the life of somebody, or that's causing them misery or pain or harm. You're confronted with this, and, and based on things that you've learned and understood, you are there to help bring a measure of healing or relief. You're, in a sense, subduing that chaos and, and calling forth a, a, a better way of being human, a, a better way of living. You're building homes and, and you're taking random timbers and electrical wires and somehow pulling all that together in a beautiful home. You're a therapist and you're working with somebody who's filled with despair or anxiety. Life isn't working for them. And they come to see you and you sit down with them and you listen to their lives. You listen to their emotions. You help them process those emotions. You help them connect dots in their lives. You help them realize what's been going on and how their behavior is flowing out of different kinds of trauma or experiences and helping them pull some pieces together so that life is more manageable, so that life can be one that flourishes again and is not bound up by despair or anxiety. I think everything that we do that's meaningful in life is in some sense participating in that God-like work of bringing order and function and purpose out of potential, unrealized potential, sometimes chaos, not necessarily evil, right? Not necessarily evil at all. And this kind of work that you and I are called to, to give ourselves to, is precisely the work that God does. And he's made this work possible for us by assuring us of his blessing, right? He blessed us with food and with abundance so that we could carry out that work. 
That is good news for you and for me as we think about our callings and our lives. Of course, we try to do it without God. That's Genesis 3. We'll save that for later. We try to do it without God. But God has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. In the beginning was the word. Jesus came and said, I was there in the beginning when you were created, when you were given your mandate as God's image bearers. I was there in the beginning and I know you've wandered away from me. I know you've rejected me, but I have come back to save you and give you life so that you might have it in abundance. This God loves us deeply and has given us a glorious mandate. I hope, friends, that as you do your work today and tomorrow and in the week ahead, as you raise your young children, as you teach in school, as you play with your friends, as you build Lego with bricks, as you do all of these things, you will sense that somehow God is using you to hover over the potential to hover over the chaos and draw from it beauty and life and purpose and meaning. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 Thanks be to God.